I'd like to invite Doug Melton. Now, Doug Melton was already introduced. I would only like to add that I cannot think of a stronger exemplar of entrepreneur academic than Doug Melton. It is with an amazing entrepreneurship energy that Doug launched the Harvard Stem Cell Institute, launched and created a new academic department, which is the only department with a joint, a joint department between two schools, and then launched Sema Therapeutics. Doug Melton, thank you. Thank you, Isaac. Um, it's great that we were able in this community to launch those things, but I did them with David Skadden as a wonderful partner. Um, I want to start by a thanks, but I think it's been a good day. Everyone gets tired at the end of the day, so I'm not going to talk for that long. Um, <clears throat> but I did want to say that I really like this mix of scientists and entrepreneurs and business people. I think that's been a lot of fun. And I'm going to present myself as sort of the opposite to the person who said things have failed and future looks dark. I am admittedly an optimist and for a number of reasons. One of them was touched on, which uh, I might just put some numbers on, is that we are in, I think, the world's best community for this sort of approach. We have a fantastic group of far thinking or far reaching capitalists. We have fantastic hospitals. Some of you may not know that we have far and away the largest concentration of stem cell scientists. There are more than a thousand stem cell scientists here in the Boston area. And so if this is going to happen, this is the place where it will happen. And I'm going to touch on all of the subjects I hope that we um, men that were mentioned today using an example which hasn't yet come up but has been in the back of people's minds, which is diabetes. Um, I'm going to, I wrote down some of the terms I heard to try to see if I could touch on them, which is whether or not the science I talk about is going to be transformative, whether it's efficacious, whether it meets um, Amitabh's value of cost um, equation. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the boring aspects and then the challenges. And I'm going to try to do this in 20 minutes in the context of diabetes. And so let's see how this one works. Yes, great. So in diabetes, you probably don't need to be reminded that the beta cell is a problem. For type 1 diabetes and type 2, um, beta cell dysfunction or loss leads to insulin dependence. Um, if I want to put some numbers on that, because I'm, we're going to try to pay attention to costs, I want to just uh, summarize it this way. Say, venture people often talk about finding a drug that will um, sell a billion dollars a year. Insulin isn't even discussed in that context. It's really a commodity. Um, these numbers here I can't defend except to say that they've been given by the CDC. So um, in 2010, the insulin market per year worldwide was 17 billion. It's estimated to be 32 billion in 2019. All type 1 diabetics require insulin injections, and about 15% of type 2 diabetics do. The markets in India and China make um, pharmaceutical companies smile because the amount of insulin that will be injected over the next decades is just going up very quickly. So um, there is one potential uh, treatment for this, which I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, but I wanted to talk about a bit, which is to combine a continuous glucose monitor with an insulin pump to make a kind of artificial pancreas to treat the disease and improve therapies. And here I'm going to show you data from really the best data from Ed Damiano here in Boston, where if we look at the blood glucose level for a diabetic, we want to, a non-diabetic, we want to keep it in the green bar range. If you can't see the numbers in the back, the numbers don't really matter. But you can say for a person that doesn't have diabetes, their blood glucose is kept between, say, 70 and 120 milligrams per deciliter, and that's you see in the top panel. In the middle panel is a typical type 1 diabetic on an insulin pump, and you see the amount of time their blood glucose is kept in the green bar in the healthy region. And in the bottom is the, among the best results obtained with the new artificial pancreas, a dual hormone pump with a continuous glucose monitor, which is a significant improvement um, on the middle panel. 
but I want you to keep the amount of black dots in the green line in your mind as you now look at what happens when you give an isla transplant. So on the top are the blood sugar levels for a person before they've had an isla transplant, and on the bottom are their blood sugars after. So what's my point here is that a, um, what Clay Christensen would call a disruptive therapy to injecting insulin is to provide the patient with insulin producing cells. I'm going to in a few slides show you the advances that have occurred over the last decade and then talk about the challenges of bringing that to market. So the idea for this isn't any kind of extremely deep intellectual, you know, thoughtful insight. It's pretty obvious. Beta cells are missing or deficient. Can you turn a stem cell into a glucose-sensing, insulin-secreting beta cell? That um, sounds a bit easier than it was to do, uh, but it was based on developmental biology. And after more than a decade of work, we've been able to find a protocol, if I just go back a slide, I guess, a protocol which takes 30 to 40 days, which does just that. And the result is shown here. These are clusters of cells, which we abbreviate as SC for stem cell beta cells, which are remarkably homogeneous. And at the bottom, you can see, in this case, 16% of the cells in that cluster are the cell we want. That is an insulin-secreting, glucose-sensing cell. So one challenge going forward is going to be to deal with the other non-beta cells there. But I won't tell you any details of this today, but we've made a lot of progress in turning those other cells into alpha glucagon producing cells and delta somatostatin producing cells. But that is not really necessary for what I'm going to argue here, which is that the clusters at this stage are so much like a human cadaveric islet that, they, that we can go ahead and think about a clinical trial. So I'm showing you on the left a cadaveric islet where you see insulin production in green and glucagon production in red compared to the SC beta cluster, which is mostly green, and some of you might see there are a few red cells in there, are a few of the alpha cells. The point of this slide is that the size of the clusters and the insulin production is comparable to what has been demonstrated to be effective in patients. That is, human cadaveric islets go into patients and control blood sugars, and we can now make these in vitro. I've said this all very quickly, and I've even noted that it's taken more than a decade to get there, but one should just pause on the fact that this is an example of what stem cells and regenerative medicine aim to do, which is to take a pluripotent cell and turn it into the cell that's missing in the patient. I was going to show you a little movie of that. If, oh yeah, here it goes, it'll work. So here's a little movie because this allows me to talk a bit about costs and scaling and manufacturing. Each one of the flasks you just saw there and you'll see again in a minute, makes enough insulin producing beta cells for one patient. Without trying to drive the costs down, the cost of the beta cells in that flask is lower than the cost of, make, of isolating beta cells from a human cadaver. So this done in a research lab means that the costs are already in range without any real effort to drive the cost down. Another way to think about it is each one of those flasks costs less than the amount of insulin that's injected to a patient for one year. So if you put those cells into a patient and they last for a year, you've already won the game on cost. And I haven't even mentioned that you've improved, in theory, blood glucose control and eliminated the prospect of long-term complications. So what is the next challenge? It's not going to be immediately making the cells. We know how to make the cells. We want to now scale up the manufacturing of that and drive the cost down, and I'll say a bit about that in a minute. But I want to touch on the challenge of how to put the cells into the right place at the right time into the patient. That's another issue that came up today. And here, um, I'm glad to say we have a lot of experts in the Boston area to help us work on this problem. Um, for type 1 diabetes, we have to protect the cell from the immune attack. For type 2 diabetics, that's not required. And I want to just talk about um, an example of why I'm enthusiastic, I would say, about using encapsulation or, or biological protection to put the cells into patients. What you see in this picture here is human uh, stem cell-derived beta cells, these clusters, inside an alginate capsule, which allows glucose to go in and hormones 
hormones, in this case insulin, to come out. And working in collaboration with Dan Anderson at MIT, um, we recently published that with, with as few as 250 of these little SC beta clusters, we can keep a mouse euglycemic, you can see it there in the green dots across the bottom, um, compared to having no injection of insulin producing cells, that's the red uh, triangles up at the top, and we're out past 190 days, that's actually past 200 days now, of controlling the blood sugars in this rodent. Now what's the point of this experiment is that 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 rodent had a fully functional immune system. There was no immunosuppressants, no degrading their immune system. These cells were protected by this mechanism. But it leaves the challenge of whether or not you could encapsulate the beta cells in microcapsules like this and put them in a person. And in general, the FDA and others think that that's unlikely to be accepted. You'd have to put hundreds of thousands of these into the body cavity. In a rodent, we get them back out by vacuuming them out. You wouldn't likely be able to do that in a person. And Gordon Weir has been working on this with us for a long time and has really favored the idea of what would generally be called a macro device, something that was retrievable. So I'll just say a bit about that. The challenges for macro devices are, well, the positive is that they're retrievable. The negative is whether you'll get sufficient nutrient, nutrient exchange, that is glucose going in, oxygen going in, and insulin coming out. This picture here shows you an example of devices that get vascularized, and that's something that we're working very um, energetically on to find the right sort of macro device into which we can put these cells. I wanted to talk then in the last few minutes um, <clears throat> about really what does the future look like. I think there are a couple of ways this could be successful. And I was reminded again by some of the negative comments and as Vicky said, um, everyone sees things through their own context. Um, I was one of the scientific founders of Gilead and while it is thought to have been a successful company, it was not successful at all on what we founded it on. I mean, th so there are lots of ways to fail and there are lots of ways to succeed. Um, and so here I'm going to tell you how I think this whole project can be successful. One way is to take the case of a diabetic that can't control their blood sugars, turn a stem cell into a functional beta cell, which we've done, and then put them into an immunoprotective device. That's really my own personal goal for treating type 1 diabetes in the short term. For type 2 diabetics, you may not need that retrievable device. One can make iPS cells, we can turn those into beta cells, and then theoretically, that's a patient-specific cure which doesn't require a retrievable device, and I'm going to talk about that in just a second. One of the challenges we all face is to make sure we have a good enough macro device, and, and that's really where I think the exciting work is being done now. And this picture shows the device being put in the arm. Um, that's worth pausing on for a moment because I forgot to remind you that among the advantages of working on this problem beyond the market size and the number of people whose lives it would change is that you can inject insulin just about anywhere. Um, you can inject it in your stomach. David would have to tell me the medical term for your butt, but you, people can, you can inject it just about anywhere and it works, okay? Um, we don't yet know where the right site for transplanting the macro devices is. We're thinking about intermuscular regions and in the omentum, but frankly that's not known. My point here is the advantage is, unlike thinking about the brain, you don't have to put the cells back in the pancreas. What you really have to do is make sure they have a good supply of oxygen and nutrients. So let me tell you about a project that's going on here and a kind of counterpart that's going on in California. Um, we recently announced this thing which we haven't been able to think of a good name for. I don't even, I'm not even good at pronouncing BERT. But it's the Boston Autologous Islet Replacement Therapy Program. And it, in, it was really started in discussions with Rich Lee, um, who helped bring Brigham and Women's, the Dana-Farber, the Stem Cell Institute, the Joslin, and Summit Therapeutics all together to say, can we use these cells now in the context of a um, insulin-dependent patient that does not have autoimmunity. And so the way we're going forward with this is, if you look at this chart, you may be able to see it, is there are a significant number of people who've had their pancreas removed, they've had a pancreatectomy, and we're going to take blood from them, make an iPS cell, generate a bank, 
differentiate those cells into beta cells and then do an autologous transplant. And so this um, will be an extremely expensive per patient. So this is not a product, I want to make that clear. This is going to be an extremely expensive experiment per patient, but it is going to demonstrate the efficacy of our product, as it were, in the absence of autoimmunity. Okay. Um, what the cost is, is hard for me to estimate. Gordon might know the most recent number, but it's a very big number. I think it comes close to a million dollars per patient because each one of these requires full tox and all kinds of regulatory tests on it. But if this works, it's going to demonstrate that this is a, a solvable problem for type 2 diabetics at a very high cost. Um, I want you to think about if that works, I particularly think about it from the patient's perspective. This is the number of syringes that my children used to use in a very short period of time. Think about what it would be like if you don't think about injecting yourself every day with a syringe and doing five to 10 blood checks a day. I forgot to say something because it's so obvious to me, but I forgot people don't think about this. The beta cell does two things. It measures your blood sugar. So for those of you who know diabetic that prick their finger to measure their blood with a glucom their blood sugar with a glucometer, if they're very anal about it, they might do it 10 times a day. The beta cell measures blood sugar every millisecond. A continuous glucose monitor does it about every 5 to 15 minutes. Nature's solution is much better, I think, than the artificial pancreas will be. So um, I want to finish up, and I know I've spoken quickly, but that's because we want to get everyone upstairs um, to think about manufacturing. So the thing on the left is real, the thing on the right is the future. On the left, then, is the size of a kind of coffee pot, a spinner flask, that makes enough beta cells for one person. And to give you the size there, I put an iPhone next to it. Um, I don't see any reason, we touched on this today, why Boston shouldn't become the world's center for cell manufacturing. Alexis talked about cell engineering as being really important, and I agree with him completely as sort of a new or invigorated academic pursuit. I got this picture from the, um, I forgot the name of the, what's the brewery in Boston? Sam Adams. This is like how you make beer. But um, <clears throat> I don't see why we shouldn't become the place where we make cells. So if you go from, as Mark Fishman said, making antibiotics to making antibodies to chemotherapy, I'd like to see Boston be the place where cells are made. Cells not just for diabetes, but cells for everything. Cells uh, for Jenna to help um, make sure that we have better tendons and ligaments, maybe cells for the brain. But certainly, we have the possibility here, as Larry Summers said, to make Boston the epicenter for this kind of regenerative medicine. So I finished by saying two kinds of thanks. One is, um, by way of disclosure, if I need that, I'm the f founder of Summit Therapeutics with others. Um, we have the venture capitalists who've helped us found that are shown here from MPM and F Prime and Novartis has invested. And AstraZeneca has invested in collaborations on drug screening with these cells. But Summit really controls all of the IP for the cell transplantation component. These then are the people in black on the left in my lab who've done this work. And in blue are on, in the right are people that we're collaborating with now to think more about the physiology and solve the transplantation problem. So if I were to summarize, um, it would be as follows. I am, you could even say, like a Pied Piper about this idea of regenerative medicine, but I'm not, I'm unabashed about that. I, I really like what Larry Summers said about we should think big and be daring on how we push this science. And this is the right city, the right community in which we should do that. And we can do that. We have the right people and the know-how here to get it done. So I'm going to finish by saying I hope you all have enjoyed this meeting as much as I have. I want to thank Vicki for organizing a fantastic uh, business panel. Um, this was really Isaac's brainchild. And what you don't know is that Curtis Keith organized the whole thing. So I really want to thank Curtis for doing any, everything. But thank you all for coming. And we'll go upstairs shortly. I guess I could take a few questions. But then we'll go upstairs and have a mixer, a reception. Thank you. <laughs>